Rock Solid Radio wants to thank Maxwell Construction, who has been our sponsor since the very beginning. For over 30 years, Maxwell has delivered the highest quality projects by holding to their core values of customer satisfaction, positive attitude, respect, and excellence. So if you have any kind of commercial construction need, give Maxwell Construction a call today at 812-537-2200. Welcome to Rock Solid Radio. This is Merle Hutchinson being joined by my explosive, explosive (laughs) wife, Linda Hutchinson. After a long weekend of celebrating all of the 4th of July stuff, now we we are back in the studio Mm -hmm. again, and we're excited today. Yeah. We we had a blast this weekend. Oh, Uh that's good. That's good. That's good. But we're going to have a blast today, too. We had a blast, and we have a special guest on the show today. We were... um, we had Rachel Cruz on the show some time back, and mm-hmm. during the show, she's like, you've got to get John on there, Dr. Yeah. John. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, well, that sounds good. So we tried to do that back in February, <laughs> and uh, that got <laughs> kind of pushed back, rescheduled, and mm-hmm. so we are back at it today, and we're going to record with Dr. John Deloney. Mm-hmm. John, welcome to Rock Solid Radio. Thank you so much, man. I'm so grateful. Yeah. yeah, she Rachel had really nice things to say about you, but she also was trash talking you too. You guys must have a love hate relationship <laughs> together. Listen, it it it's got to be hard sitting by me. A, <laughs> you can see I'm incredibly attractive and just so much smarter than she is, and so I know it's tall on her. Can't wait no, to she, let her hear that, right? Mm-hmm. She's one of the most wonderful, brilliant people I've ever had the chance to meet, much less work with. So she's a great favorite. Well, it's kind of cool. You guys both have your own podcasts. Um, both authors, but then when you guys come together, there is some dynamite, you know, some real explosions <laughs> that go occur between the two of you guys. You have a great chemistry. Well, I appreciate that. She's, um, yeah, she's she's helped me a lot in, in behind the scenes and navigating how the camera works. And uh, we do a lot of live events together all over the country. So she's fantastic. Wow. And if those that are listening don't know, Rachel Cruz is the daughter of Dave Ramsey. Um, you're part of the Ramsey Solution. Your book is actually printed by Ramsey. Um, do they have he was the own? publisher on that too. Yep, they got yeah, the in-house publishing, publishing company. company. And he also yeah. done the, the foreword of it. So yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about your book today, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. So before we get to that, though, we want to thank some of our sponsors for um, their support of Rock Solid Radio. We want to thank Casey's Outdoor Solutions. We want to thank Hummel Insurance Group and Maxwell Construction for their support of what we're doing today. Um, Rock Solid Radio, Rock Solid Families, which is the parent company of this podcast. And so we're really appreciative of their support of just messages like this this is so important john because there's a lot of people hurting out there right now yeah it's it's a absolute mess um in in a, in a way that me as just a natural ho hummy uh optimist just kind of be bopping around town i we went to an event this weekend in the middle of nowhere i've got bug bites in places i didn't know you could get bug bites <laughs> and uh I looked at my wife and there was probably three or 400 people out there in this big field watching fireworks. And I told her that's the fist of the first time I think that I can remember um, at least in the last decade or so that um, I'm having to be careful about my pessimism, optimism, scale tilting uh, out of whack. It's a, it's a, it's a tough season out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, before we get into a whole lot, um, could you give us a little bit of your background just so that uh, our listeners out there and viewers kind of know a little bit of your story and what uh, what is the the environment and the, even the, the family history that created this guy named John Deloney? <laughs> Sorted tale, but um, in, in, in 30 seconds, it, my dad was a, um, I was raised in Houston and um, I was raised uh my dad was a homicide detective for the Houston police department. He was also a SWAT hostage negotiator. So he was an incredible man um, and did hard stuff every day. And he moved us out to the woods about 45 minutes, 40 minutes, 30 minutes North of town. And in very, very late seventies, 78, 79. And then the oil chemical boom hit Houston and bajillionaires moved in from all over the planet. Most people don't know that Houston's, I think it's the most diverse city in the United States. And so people came from everywhere, but our little town where my dad made $19,000 a year suddenly was surrounded by multimillionaires. And so it was a fascinating, fabulous, wonderful place to grow up. It was an incredible childhood. And at the same time, 
I got to learn a bunch of languages. And what I mean by that is I learned how wealthy people look at the world. And I also grew up in a home where um, I watched my dad secretly weep because we didn't have enough money for groceries. Right. And so there was this toggle back and forth. Um, and then my mom was not allowed to go to college. She grew up in a system that said Christian women have one place and that's to stay at home and you need to be quiet about it. And at 42, she took her first community college class. And then at 43, she took another one. And my dad, my dad had been like, Hey, please, like we, the world needs you. And it's like, well, you know, and so I was a freshman in high school, I think it was. And ultimately at 57, she graduated with her PhD. She'd worked at Enron for a while wow. and now she's in her seventies and um, she's still a college professor and she travels all over, teaches at Oxford, she teaches all over the world. Um, but she's just this gangster. So I learned from my parents in a, one of those ways that you absorb it, right? It's by osmosis. Number one, if there's a problem, you go in, like if there is something on, on fire, you enter in and go help. And the second thing is it, you are net, there's ages isn't real. Limitations are very real and they're very overcomable. And so whatever the world puts in front of you, whether it's messaging, whether it's you're not enough, whether it's people treat you differently because of how you look, whatever the thing is, all that's very, very real. And then you get to decide, are you going to struggle through it um, or are you going to accept it? And so that just became a way of that's, that was the air I breathed growing up. Yeah. And then you look up and I've spent the last 20 years working in um, I was a high school teacher and elementary school teacher. And then I was a professor um, and a dean of students for almost almost 20 years and uh, working in the evenings with police departments for several years. So I've been working with people when the wheels fall off and helping people say, okay, what comes next? Yeah. You know, in your, in your book, John, own your past and change your future. You talk a lot about stories and um, that's something that's really powerful in our work too, in marriage and family coaching about what's your story. Um, but a lot of people will think that like, that's almost like, they can't rewrite it. They can't change it. So tell us a little bit about the five steps that you've created in your book that really help us to get the life we desire, you know, right? To, to have what we want, um, maybe not things that we ever dreamed that we could have. Tell us a little bit about those steps. So I th a couple things about the steps. One, I wrote the book and, and submitted the manuscript. And one, they knocked out about 60,000. The editors were like, this is cool. This is about eight books, right? And as a classic <laughs> academic, I talk too much and, and run my I think everything's important. Um, the second thing is, she, the editor called me back and she said, hey, you know there's a path through here. You want me to acknowledge this? You want me to bring this to light? And I said, I don't believe in paths. I don't believe in seven steps to new abs or what. I don't, I don't <laughs> subscribe to that way of living and um, much less teaching. And she said, well, it's very clear in here. And so as I went, I said, you let me know. And she pulled it up and I was like, oh no, there's a path, <laughs> right? I didn't want that. <laughs> um, and so ultimately I didn't invent this. I, I, anybody who says they created the seven steps to being well is trying to sell you something. Right. And really, these are five principles that you can put in your back pocket or really, for me, tattoo them across your chest and say, life is going to continue to hand you things. The moment you think everything's great, your air conditioner is going to fail and your roof is going to leak and your mom's going to call and say she's got cancer. Right. So life is a continual spin cycle. Mm -hmm. What we have bought into as a culture is there's a there there. I can just get enough money, if I can just get the right certificate on my wall, just get the right um, pat on the back, then I'll quote unquote be okay. And that's just not how it works. And so really these five principles were, they're as ancient as time and they're woven through scripture. They're woven through all the great wisdom literature, right? They're woven through um, my counseling training, right? Ultimately it rises up. Number one, you have to own your story. And talking about what you, I think we get stuck trying to rewrite things that have happened to us and mm -hmm. where healing begins is there's a period at the end of that sentence. You were abused. Your dad left. These things happened to you, period, with a full stop. You grew up in a community that treated you less than because of the color of your skin. That happened, mm -hmm. right? And you have to put a period at the end of that sentence. And most of us spend our entire lives, all of our energy, all of our efforts, trying to go back and rewrite stories that can't be rewritten no. instead of focusing on 
the only thing we can write is what comes next, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think number one is you got to own the stories you were born into, the stories you were told, the stories of the things that you did, and all of those things become the stories that you tell yourself. Um, a real easy pass through that is some of us grew up in a house where God was not real. That's like not a thing, right? It's a cute fairy tale and that's fine. Some of us grew up in a house where God is your number one cheerleader. He's your best friend. He is rooting for you and he wants you to get a good parking spot and he wants you to get a good uh, APR on your mortgage. God is your number one. Um, and then some of us grew up in a house where God is watching you. And if you screw up, he can't wait because he's a God of vengeance and justice. And he can't wait to send you off with the goats and torture you and, and maim you for all of eternity to get him away from you. Right. Depending on what story you were born into about this deity that's watching you or isn't has a profound effect on the way ultimately you talk to yourself and the way you interact with other people and the things that you think you can do and the things you think you can't do. And so you fast forward 30 years and your boss calls you in and says, hey, uh, I know you haven't trained for this particular job, but we want to make you the vice president and move you into this role. Your first thought could be. I can do anything. I can do all things through. Your first thought may be, I can't. I don't want to screw this up. Everybody's watching. Or if your other thought may be, it doesn't matter, right? And all of that is based in a story that you were born into so long ago and that your people, your, your teachers and your parents or your coaches, whoever reinforced the stories. And the part that was the light bulb moment for me several years ago was all of these stories have a biochemical consequence your body's always spinning up cortisol and adrenaline and, and neuromodulator all the stuff that's always happening and we could be nerds for a while if you wanted to but that tends to <laughs> people's eyes gloss over um all of it has a consequence and so we've moralized some of these things and we've characterized some of these things ultimately i've got to sit down and say i got to own these stories these things happen to me and then i've got to acknowledge reality and most of us didn't mean to open our eyes and suddenly we're 50 pounds heavier than we intended to be, or we are in a marriage that's abusive and we haven't said anything, or we're a dad and we are better at work than we are with our kids. And so suddenly 10 years later, we work 110 hours a week and our kids have no idea who we are um, or that we go home and just drop down on the couch and watch Netflix and watch Netflix. So you've got to acknowledge reality. This is kind of like how my friend, Dave Ramsey, he, he says, you can't get out of debt until you sit down on the yellow pad and write down, how much do I owe everybody? Right. 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 That's yeah. And that's a lot of times. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, that's a lot of times where we come in is that people are coming in with these stories that either somebody's told them, like you said, or they believe for themselves or they were born into. And, and then they're like, now what? Now what do we do? And so part of that is for us to help them put up a mirror and say, acknowledging reality, like, where are you and where do you want to go? And, and sometimes they don't want to really hear. We're not telling them what they want to hear. We're telling them what they need to hear. And sometimes they don't like that very much. Well, and, and I think as a culture, that's where we are. I think we get stuck between one and two, right? We know that we don't feel good. We know that our knees hurt and our back hurts and our neck hurts. And we know that I'm sharing a bed with somebody and I'm two inches apart from her or him, but they're 2,000 miles away from each other. Like We know that inherently. We know that our middle schoolers are just middle schoolers. Um, and then suddenly they are a little bit less present and a little bit more sassy and a little, and we just distance ourselves, right? We know all this stuff. We don't want to look in that mirror and say, this is my reality. And that leads to number three is, um, you can, you'd have to ask yourself that terrifying, scary question. What are you going to do next? And yeah. that's where these things work in a really an infinity loop. Um, I think that the literature is pretty clear. There is none zero. And I know we live in like, yeah, I was uh, working with a Navy SEAL this morning before this call. I, I get, those are my, I love those folks. I worked with cops for years. My dad's a cop. I love that community. Um, but there's very much this sense of where's the problem and let's go crush it. Yeah. <laughs> before you get there, there is no long-term behavior change. There is no systemic transition done in isolation. So most people want to go lose 50 pounds. They want to go read some more books or get a new degree. Or they want to go fix their marriage. I tell people before you do anything, you have to get a group of people to do life with you. And that might be a counselor. That might be a therapy group. That might be a group of coaches. That might be a group of friends who meet at your house on Monday nights. Men are, are by far the worst. And I think we've been socialized out of relationships completely. Mm -hmm. um, 
all that to say is you can't go on and do other things long term. You can white knuckle your way to 35 pounds of weight loss and you can start emptying the dishwasher more. Um, but long term, you're just going to roll back to where you were because your body craves that homeostasis, right? So you get a, gr a crew and then four and five is just alternating between changing your thoughts and changing your actions over time. And that's really the crux of right when things are great, mom gets sick and then bam, we are back to mm. acknowledging the stories. I thought mom was going to live forever, owning reality. Now I've got to be, be I got to call some friends and say, hey, my mom's sick. And then I got to go be about changing my life. John, I in your book, you, you talk a lot about loneliness. You talk about those friendships and how to create friendships or get friendships. And I love your story about you and your wife sitting and having friends over and asking me if they'll be your friends. And some it of them the were worst. like, <laughs> like, it was the like, worst. Can we, can we pay you? Can we? I mean, it, dude, I didn't, I didn't know what else to do. I just looked at the data and I knew I, I was leaving 20 year friendships, 30 year friendships. And I know my body will systematically fall apart on me. If I don't have other people. Because you're and moving I, to a new city, right? Like, yeah. So we moved to a yeah. new city. That's right. Yeah. yeah. We moved to a new city. We didn't know anybody. We knew, we knew a few people, but I, I didn't, there was no rule book for how to be 30 or 40 years old and make new friends. Um, yeah. And so it was like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> what was fantastic was how my wife makes fun of me about how co incredibly aware and perceptive I am in some areas and how completely off the wall I've missed things and yeah. inviting a couple to my table and saying, Hey, my wife and I have been talking and we really like y'all and we have an awkward conversation to have with you. I didn't realize. <laughs> what, the Will you marry me? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that they were taking that invitation. And there was a, there was a, a grand exhale in the room when I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you're so right. I mean, we live in a culture and you talk a lot about this in your book about how we, you know, and I, I can't find this place, but you're talking about how we have thousands of followers, but we don't have anybody help move our couch, you know? Right. Right. And, and, and that's the reality of is like, we think we're so connected, but we have never been more isolated and disconnected and lonely. And that I think comes and, and from this a is, lot of This problems. is new for human history. And I think it's important to back up for a second. This has never existed. This has never been, our bodies are simply not designed this way to even the idea of people consuming this podcast right now with headphones in up until 20 or 30 years ago, all the way to, to the beginning of human time to have an in-depth conversation with other people or to, or to have a ringside seat to that and not be in the same room with them mm -hmm. is unheard of. It's not, it's never happened before. And so we're asking our brains and bodies to do things they've never been asked to do. And then we wonder why everybody's anxious and everybody's depressed and everybody's got all these different diagnostics that are really just the alarm bells going off at a, at a body being asked to do things it can't do. Yeah, John, we have seen that, uh, you know, in the parenting world, you know, the last two generations, really, I'll say 20 or so years, we almost prided ourselves as parents that we could build a big enough house that everybody could be in their own room, everybody could have their own TV, mm -hmm. everybody could do their own thing. And then, you know, fast forward a few more years later, and now we have our own TVs that we carry with us at all times. I don't even have to be in my room. I can be anywhere. And so the isolation part, uh, it really shows in the social skills or lack of uh, with a lot of our younger kids. And, and um, adults. <laughs> yeah. And, and so now to problem solve, I no longer have to ask an adult. I can Google it, mm -hmm. right? And so I can get a, a non-emotional response out of Google uh, that really doesn't know my uh, emotional mm -hmm. capability or lack of. And so th it really is a dangerous storm. And we're seeing that, like, I'll say more in Linda's work because she deals with a lot of girls. Mm -hmm. Guys can kind of isolate and just kind of grow, I'll say, more numb. They, they, they think it's just okay, but they're just numb anyway. They didn't really socialize in a great way to begin with. But girls are really being impacted by a lot of this Um with the amount of depression and anxiety and yeah. self-harm mm -hmm. that we're getting out of the young high school girls. And it's like, holy cow, like, we're okay, for relationship. something's not right here, folks. We need to do something differently. Yeah. I, I actually was moved by, um, I don't know if you've run across Terrence Real. Um, he's not a faith-based writer, but um, did some research on male depression. And it was a huge light bulb moment for me that when you look at the data that says that girls and emerging women are, um, X number of times more likely to be anxious or depressed than men are. His challenge to that is men are equally, if not more anxious and depressed. It just looks differently than the scales. And so um, 
whereas women might shut down or might rattle at the seams, men put their chest out and they get loud and they get angry and they get raged out. And when I step back and look at our political landscape and what's all the yelling and screaming, I think, oh, everybody's struggling. And this is the exact same thing as that. It's just manifesting itself differently. across. That's gender. true. Yeah. In our work, like I, I, I work with a lot of men and the number of men, I, I occasionally have men that come in and talk about anxiety and depression, but I have a ton of men that come in and talk about anger. Right. And so I've really realized that they're, they're all the same, uh, different sides of the right. same coin. It just is wow. how you manifest it. And so that anger that we're seeing and that, that, like you said, I just have to make my mane, my, my lion's mane look a little <laughs> bit bigger so that I can yeah. not fall and be a victim to everything that's trying to threaten me. Yeah. Instead of just stepping back and saying, I'm scared. You yeah. say those words, yeah. man, your body goes, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Totally yeah. Surrender. Different yeah. Yeah. So you're getting connected is that middle step of like, we can't do this in isolation, you know, as much as the enemy wants us to think that we can, and that's part of the, the lie. And so getting connected healthy people. I always ask my clients, like, who's in your yard, right? Like, who are the healthy people who are speaking into your life? Who are your cheerleaders? Who are your support system? And so the next two steps really are, well, how do you get out of it? And so, John, tell us a little bit about what comes next after you get connected and, and connect yourself with some healthy people that aren't going to just tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear, then what? So... Two two complaints it drilled distilled down into these into these um, next two steps. One is, I think where the mental health community has let us down. They've done some extraordinary things over the last 100, 150 years. Where they've let us down is, I think the chief narrative is if you get the right thoughts in the right order, then you're going to be quote unquote well. Then then you'll have mental health, mental wellness, and I think that to some degree, thinking through and connecting the dots. Oh, I'm responding to my wife this way because my body's got a, a has developed in, and honed in a defense mechanism against rejection that was, that set, since I was set, that's important to thread that across. Mm -hmm. But you can't be mentally healthy if you know all about anxiety and you mainline coffee all day and you don't sleep and you don't exercise and you don't move your body and you don't have intimate relationship like you're asking your body your brain to to duct tape over this mm -hmm. entire thing here and we've bifurcated it academically from there's mental health over here and psychiatric help over here and surgery over here and heart disease over here man it's all the same system yeah. and if you don't look at it that way you tend to <laughs> like oh, i'm just going to give you an appendectomy over here and you know, cholesterol medicine over here, and I'll give you anxiety medicine over here. And we, so all I have to say is you have to, have to be about um, changing your actions. I got to do things differently. I can't just think different things. I've got to change things in my life. Um, and the other one is I, I never knew this and it's frustrating. And we could go back a hundred years and figure out why, but I thought that my thoughts were me number one, and that I was my thoughts. And I thought my feelings were the, the lighted path forward. I didn't know that I could change my thoughts. I didn't know that, um, no, you, we're all going to get those lightning bolts in our heads, right? We're all going to get those, those unpleasant things that pop in there. I didn't realize that I could, both in the short term and in the long term, not think about those things. Mm -hmm. And it came out of the work working with traumatized children and seeing things as a parent and learning over time, I don't have to picture my child in some sort of distress 24-7, 365. I can also choose to think of them laughing and remember them on the big wheel being silly or catching that little bitty fish that they thought was so big. I can, over time, choose which of those I, man I, I think on. And so it goes back to Seligman's work. What If you ask me the most important finding in psychology of the last 100 years, I would tell you the idea that optimism is a learned behavior, which ultimately means optimism, looking for beauty and looking for joy despite the calamities is a, is a choice. I get to decide that. And so, um, go, and it's like transform the renewing of your mind is a, I, I thought that was a snap your fingers one time moment. No, dude, it's a, it's a practice to continually change my thoughts in real time. What that looks like. I, my wife and I have a hard conversation at night about cleanliness and you're not helping out around the house and this and that. 
And the next morning I walk in the door and her shoes are right by the door. And I think we just talked about this. <laughs> At that moment, I have a choice. Mm -hmm. I can decide to go down the rabbit hole, which by the way, has a whole cascade of biochemical re responses here. Mm -hmm. That's going to set my body up to fight or to run, which are the two things we're seeing in marriages. Yeah, y'all know that we're going to fight each other, or I'm just going to disappear in this marriage. Um, I can decide to, to think she did that on purpose. We just had this talk and she's trying to send a message to me. Oh, she doesn't think I do enough. And now I'm into my childhood stories about how I'm not good enough. And that, or I can think this, whoo, those shoes are there. We just talked about this. She must've had a crazy day with those kids. I'm going to go do the dishes right now. And then I'm going to ask her, what can I do? I'm going to take bedtime. I got bedtime tonight too. And I'm going to ask her, is there anything else she needs tonight? I get to pick one of those right. avenues and one of them is going to lead me to stroke and heart attack and divorce and anger and rage. And one of those is going to completely, completely change my physiology. It's going to completely change my marriage. And I get to pick one of those tracks. Right? Yeah. And it's a conscious, <clears throat> I'm going to think about these things, not those. Things. Right. Yeah. The, the uh, you know, the, the thing that you're bringing up there is something that we deal with all the time in marriages and the idea of, what is your assumption on their intentions? Yeah. And so our our news uh, is all about very cynical mm -hmm. intentions. Oh, well, they intended to hurt us. Yeah. yeah. And so when, when I'm in this situation with my wife, every time she mm -hmm. does even a little thing that I don't like, I'm assuming negative intention. She tried to hurt me. She tried to disrupt me. And so we're talking all the time, like when we first work with a couple, the idea of, okay, let's just boil it down. Is this a person of good intentions or are they just an evil, nasty person? <laughs> like, let, oh, well, they're good intentions. Okay, then we got to start thinking that way. Right. We have to start talking that way. Right. That the shoes left out, it was not like, ha, 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 this You're will really mad. piss them off, <laughs> you know? So, so that idea is just, yeah. but that comes from the culture. And I love what you're talking about there, like, this is a self-talk. Mm -hmm. I, I am in charge of my self-talk. I'm the one owning this. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we allow our kids to have negative self-talk patterns, when we allow ourselves to have those, listen, we can arrest those. And so we have a thing here, like when our kids are running around the house, belly aching about things, it's like, stop it right yeah. now. You yeah. own it. And what, what are you going to do to make it better? Yeah. What, are you, what are you going to do? Because we're not going to look for external fixes. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, we go to the doctor to get the anxiety medicine. We go to all these other things to fix us. And it's like, no, what are you going to do? And let's move forward. Yeah. But your words. Some of these things are just not hard. Some of them are disengaging for a minute or going for a walk or getting in a, in a room where you can look foolish for a second and just moving your body for a second mm -hmm. some of it's lifting weights and some of it's yoga and some of it's calling a friend and saying i'm not okay right. um we've just taken all of those practices out of our lives and just said hit the gas go as fast as you can and change the oil when the when the engine melts together and it's just a it's just a bizarre way to live when you st actually step out of the matrix and look at it it's just a, a weird way to but John, as you said in your last two steps, they've got to coincide. Your words and your actions have to match. And that's really where that peace comes from. Because if you're saying one thing and you're doing another, especially whether it's to your kids or to your friends or f trying to fool your family or your workplace, like that's where the anxiety and the depression comes mm -hmm. from. Because like you're not in, in sync with your body and your mind. And so they've got to come together. And mind, body, and spirit, as you said, have got to all work together for there to be that peace and to find that joy. And that's what we try to help folks do because we know that that you just can't have one without the other. It's been a process. So um, somebody asked me about six months ago, like, why are you writing this? And it kind of just came out in this way. We've got a narrative that says, culturally, we've got two. One <laughs> is you are your feelings. Whatever you feel is, quote unquote, your truth, which is just that, that, <laughs> that, that statement in and of itself is, is nuts. You are your show. truth. You get to make it up as you go. And it's the world's job to respond to your path. Mm -hmm. And by the way, your feelings are so important because you will always be the worst thing that ever happened to you. You'll always be a survivor of X. You will always be the worst thing you ever said, the worst thing you ever did. 
that's all you'll ever be. And so you have to have some external entity come mm. rescue you because you in of yourself are dysfunctional. You're broken. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the other side of the pendulum, we hit it too far as a culture and it's feelings are for cowards and weak and broken people. Shut your mouth and crush it. Hit the gas and go and go. And when you think you can't go anymore, you can do 20% more and right, just go. <laughs> That's right? that Navy SEAL you were talking about. That's with. exactly right. That's right. <laughs> and so in the middle here is what I'm calling the new third way, which is you have to acknowledge your feelings. They are real and they are signals and they're your body trying to tell you something. And you got to understand that your signals lie, that your feelings don't tell you the truth all the time. There, this morning, I did not want to work out. I didn't feel like it, but I knew that if I don't, by this evening, I'm not going to be as present of a husband and a dad. I'm not going to be as sharp on the radio this afternoon. So I'm going to go do these things. Mm -hmm. The other side of it is um, I also knew I have, a, I have a program I'm working through right now with, with weights. I also know I've been on the road. I've been traveling. I'm exhausted. And so I put a 25-pound plate in a backpack and went for an hour walk. I didn't try to hammer it in the gym because I also have to be smart about listening to my body. So it's both and, right? Mm -hmm. I have to acknowledge my feelings and then I also have to go, go do the right next thing. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. Great stuff. So you, you had a, uh, a statement in your book that uh, I'm kind of, yeah, well, this, <laughs> now this is, well, th this is, I think, something that I think is very real. It brings us back down to God's nature of how we're designed. And, and your comment was, we're trying to jam an electric car charger into the backside of the mule pulling our buggy, and it's not working. And I said, heavily edited, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I and I got a kick out of it because it's like at the end of the day we are wired the way we are wired. We are we are biologically, uh, biochemically designed in God's uh, design, and we're trying to tweak it on all these external fronts with how we could operate. Mm. And technology, as good as it can be in one area, it, it can be so destructive and misleading in other areas. And so what kind of, what was your point in, in, in making that statement and how it uh, really um, relates to helping people? I, I just was, I got really caught up for a decade into, in the, in the quote unquote biohacker world. Um, mm -hmm. I was chasing technological solutions to the messes I was creating on a minute by minute basis in my life. And it was like continually cutting myself with, with a knife, always looking for the, an upgraded Band-Aid. And it just seems like we are, con we are creating issues and then trying to create solutions to the issues. Um, I, I was a dean of students at a law school for five years, and I'll never forget a really lovely guy. He's a brilliant man, but he's kind of soft-spoken, which is strange for a professor in a law school. And he said... You got to remember, John, there is no money in prevention. There's only money in a cure. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. And I began to look around, what am I trying to cure in my life that I could otherwise just stop upstream, right? Stop hurting. And then you guys probably got the same training in, in counseling. I'll never forget what my professor said. We have a duty as counselors to sit down and extend an arm and pull people up out of the muck out of the river mm -hmm. but you also have an ethical responsibility to make your way upstream as far as you can and see why do people keep falling in right mm -hmm. and so that was it was just a statement like man electric cars are cool but and i, I would love to get one <laughs> do we have to drive 120 like why can we leave 10 minutes earlier and if i can't leave 10 minutes earlier i've created a life that my body cannot exist in and i've created a fatherhood picture for my children that will destroy them and I've created a wife and a marriage network that is electrified because it's too busy if I can't leave 10 minutes earlier. And so it began, it became just a reverse engineering of our lives and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. great, great point. Oof. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> as we try to wrap up here, John, what is it that you would want to leave our audience? I mean, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would want to make sure moving forward? 
our listeners here because there's so much good stuff, by the way, in this book. And um, we so appreciate you being on and sharing a little bit. But is there is there one last thought that you would want to make sure our listeners hear? over again and this is doesn't matter what your net worth is this doesn't matter what your job is i you know i I did i spoke for a a group of people who run and own gas stations and all the way to big huge rooms full of business leaders and executives and everybody i talk to is dealing with loneliness and this this isolation i'm by myself in this deal and it's been become important for me to back out of the loneliness conversation, not as a moral or character issue, but as a set of skills we don't have. Mm-hmm. And I want people to look at loneliness, not as I'm a loser. Nobody wants to hang out with me. I don't know. I don't, I, I can't hang out with other people. They're annoying. They vote differently. Than me. That's the wrong way to look at it. I want to look at it as a set of skills. We've just lost in a generation or two um, the ability to be awkward, the ability to, hear something that we disagree with and not run or not lob a grenade back. (laughs) And so what I'm trying to do with myself, trying to do with the the folks that are walking alongside me is I want to practice doing life. I want to practice getting into community with people. And that means even when I'm tired, I'm going to call somebody and say, Hey, you want to come over and bring some dinner over and grab a drink or tonight I'm going to a concert. It's, it's the middle of a week and it's a big mosh pitting show And I'm too tired. And I invited my wife and a couple of people from our church. And I thought this is going to be a bananas evening. (laughs) Everything in my body says, dude, just go to bed. And that means I got to go. Because I also know tomorrow morning, I'm going to smile from ear to ear and know we had a blast, right? So it's, I'm going to put myself in these positions to begin to learn this set of skills. The same as if I was getting into wood cutting or into jujitsu as in the middle of, of life. We were given passes as kids. We were put in the same rooms with people to go be friends with, to go do life with. And then we woke up and we were 30 and we don't have any friends. And so um, I have to know that if I don't have community, I'm going to die. I'm going to take people with me. And that's just a harsh truth. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to start learning some skills. I'm going to start putting myself in awkward positions around people who think and, and listen and do life differently than me. And then I'm going to learn how to do this friendship thing again. Wow. Mm. That's yeah. awesome. Good, good stuff. Mm. Well, John, we want to thank you again for just joining mm. us on Rock Solid Radio, and we greatly appreciate uh, the work that you're doing mm. and just the messaging that you're putting out there. How can people uh, get in touch? I know we have your book here, Own Your Past and uh, Change Your Future. So all of you out there, you can see that as I hold that mm-hmm. up. Okay. So, But how else can people hear you on a regular basis? Mm-hmm. I know you said you're on the radio. Um, so how can they get in touch with you? You can follow me at John Deloney on Instagram. That's really the only internet-y thing that I know how it works. Uh, my <laughs> wife tells me I was born in the wrong century. So, um, uh, and you can find me there and, um, or you can go to johndeloney.com, pick up books and other tools like that. And then I, I've got my own podcast that um, is a blast. And then I co-host uh, the Ramsey Show with Dave. And I, in fact, me and Rachel are doing it tomorrow together. And so <laughs> okay. we'll be hassling each other for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Good, good stuff. All right. Well, uh, as we close things up, we want to thank uh, mm-hmm. all of the folks that's, that sponsor us, uh, Maxwell Construction, Casey's Outdoor Solutions, and Hummel Insurance. We also want to just thank all of our listeners. Guys, you know, if you want this kind of shows, if you want these kind of messages, if you want to learn, if you want to be challenged, then please uh, listen to our show, but share our show. Give us those five-star ratings and, and just help get these kind of messages out mm-hmm. there and going. This is just a healthy um, a healthy message here today in terms of getting connected, kind of owning your past, owning your story, and let's do something to make it better. Let's yeah. let's change our our life and then moving forward, change the next generation for the positive. Yeah. John, thank you so much for being on Rock Solid Radio. It was such a pleasure to get to meet you and we're so thankful for your work. So we uh, will continue to pray for you and uh, we thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much. I'm grateful for your hospitality. Yeah. So thank you for listening to Rock Solid Radio, building a stronger community, one family at a time. Make it a great day. Building a stronger community, one family at a time. Make it a great day. 
Rock Solid Radio wants to thank Hummel Insurance Group for sponsoring today's show. Hummel Insurance Group now owns and operates seven different offices located throughout the tri-state area. For over 50 years now, the Hummel Insurance Group has been assisting customers with insurance needs and questions. For all your insurance needs, contact Hummel Insurance Group at 812-537-1785. Rock Solid Radio wants to thank Casey's Outdoor Solutions. Casey's is a premier garden center and gift shop located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. They offer a wide selection of high quality plants, landscaping materials, and home decor. They do amazing high quality work and can help you transform your indoor and outdoor living spaces into something beautiful. So stop by Casey's Outdoor Solutions today and let them know you appreciate their support for Rock Solid Radio. Visit Casey's today at 21481 State Line Road, Lawrenceburg, Indiana.